Today, we're actually concluding a four-part message series. It's called The Good Work, and we're looking at an incredible story about an ordinary guy from the Old Testament named Nehemiah who does a very, very good work. Here's what I know about you, and I believe this with all of my heart, that you are not created by an accident, that by the providence and goodness of our God, he knew exactly what he was doing when he made you. He formed you, gave you gifts, passions, desires to do something that makes an eternal difference in this world, and that today I believe the Spirit of God will speak to many of you to stir you, to shake you, to move you, to inspire you to a good work for the glory of God. I believe that God has a good work for every single one of us to do things that make an eternal difference. Let me bring you up to speed about uh, Nehemiah in case you missed earlier weeks. Uh, who is Nehemiah? Nehemiah was an ordinary guy from the Old Testament. He was not a prophet, not a pastor, not a king, not a warrior, not a um, building contractor. He was a regular guy who was actually serving the king, um, Artaxerxes of Persia, in a role known as a cupbearer. He was kind of like a consultant or a servant and an advisor to the king. And he heard from his brother about the plight of his people. If you missed earlier weeks, we studied that in the year 587 BC, under the reign of the evil king Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians came in and completely destroyed Judah, crushed Solomon's temple, burned the gates, left the city in complete ruins, and literally thousands of thousands of Jewish people were taken into captivity. Decades passed, and no one could seem to rebuild the wall. Then one day, Nehemiah's brother traveled to see Nehemiah and told him about the plight of his people, and Nehemiah's heart sank. He was broken on the inside because the people of God were vulnerable, they had no leadership, no direction, and so Nehemiah started seeking the heart of God. And you'll notice over and over and over again, he prays all through the book. You'll see 12 different times recorded in scripture that he prays and seeks God. He goes before the king, he asks permission to leave his job, to travel back to his homeland, to try to assess the situation, to perhaps assemble some people, to believe that God could maybe do through him what had not happened through anybody else, perhaps God could use him to lead the people to rebuild the wall. At first, things did not go well. Eventually, they started to make progress. But what do we know as soon as we start to make spiritual progress? As the work goes down, the opposition always heats up. The moment you start creating movement on behalf of the things that matter to God, your spiritual enemy will show up and try to resist the very work that God put in your heart. In fact, I always say this, if your enemy can't destroy you, he will distract you. He will do whatever he can to take your eyes off your mission, off your calling, off your purpose, and distract you from God's will. And that's exactly what happened in this story. The wall started to go up. And the enemies, Sanballat, Tobiah, and a guy named Geshem, who that sounds like an enemy, Geshem, showed up and tried to distract Nehemiah off of the job. That's why the title of this message is Shut the Door on Distractions. Shut the Door on Distractions. Let's look at Nehemiah chapter six, verses one and two, and you'll see the enemy's plan to divert Nehemiah off of God's mission. A scripture says this, Sambalat, Tobiah, and Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies found out that I had finished rebuilding the wall and that no gaps remained. This was a miraculous accomplishment. Though we had not yet set up the, uh, the doors in the gates. So what did Sambalat and Geshem do? Sambalat and Geshem sent a message asking me, asking Nehemiah, to meet them at one of the villages in the plain of Ono. Nehemiah, stop building the wall. Stop doing the work of God. We don't like you, we're trying to stop you. Meet us at one of the villages in the plain of Ono. 
Tip number one, you may wanna write this down. Whatever you do, never meet with your enemies in a place called Ono. <laughs> don't ever do it. Whatever you do, don't go to Ono to meet with your enemies. What's interesting to me when you look at this is to think about perhaps how someone like us today in our context might have translated that opportunity to meet with the enemies. Think about what we might say. Oh my gosh, they hate me. They don't like what I'm doing. This is an opportunity to convert my critics. Or this is an opportunity to go and expand my influence. Can I use our language of the day? This is an opportunity for me to build my brand. This may be an opportunity for me to reach more people, establish and build my name. The problem is what we often think is an opportunity, God calls a distraction. So often what we think might be my opportunity to do something more is actually a distraction from our enemy trying to take us, divert us off the very purpose for which we've been created. The enemy say, please come meet with us. Please come meet with us. Please come meet with us. We're trying to distract you. I would argue that perhaps there's never been an easier time to be distracted in the history of the world than it is today. So many distractions everywhere you look. Bing, bing, ah, ah, ah. Hey, uh, today, it's so easy, have you noticed, to become great at doing things that don't matter. It's never been easier to be passionate about wasting your time. If the devil can't destroy you, he'll get really excited simply distracting you. So what do we see in the story? The enemies, the critics, they asked Nehemiah for a meeting. Hey, let's have a meeting. And Nehemiah rejected the meeting, why? So he could stay on task and keep building the wall. Nehemiah, will you meet with us? No. Nehemiah, can we have a meeting? No, Nehemiah, we wanna to talk to you about your philosophy and help you see another way. No, 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 and no. I would submit to you that one of the most strategic skills that you can develop in order to do what God has called you to do is the ability to say no to other things that might distract you. No is one of your most important words. In fact, if you ask me in my life today, I would say that my default answer, because of the important task in front of me, my default answer to almost everything that comes my way today is no. You actually grow with your no's, not with your yeses. I don't wanna be distracted by things that would take me out of God's perfect will. How do you say no? When someone asks you, hey, can I have a meeting? Can we do this? Can you come do this for me? How do you say no? What I wanna do is I wanna teach you today very carefully how to say no. The way you say no is just like this. You say it like this, you say, no. That's how you do it. <laughs> I, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna show you again because there are some of you that might have missed it. The way you do it, the, 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 te the technique actually matters. What you do is you tilt your head up slightly to the side like this. And then when you say it, you don't have to frown. You don't have to be angry. You can even smile, but you bring your head slightly down this way and then you just say it, no, just like it, no. Try it, just, no, okay, if you don't move your face right, it doesn't really matter. All of our campuses, one, two, three, no. Are you gonna do it? No. Do you wanna buy it? No. Are you gonna go? No. Here's the deal. Don't say maybe when you mean no. Don't waste my time. Don't waste anybody's time. Get ready, this will set you free. No is a complete sentence. <laughs> you don't even have to say no because. No, no, no. Even Jesus, especially Jesus, often said no. There'd be crowds of people and he'd heal a lot of them and then he'd say, I'm done for the day. And he would walk away. He wasn't being mean, he was being wise. There were many times he would say no to the crowds so he could say yes to his father. 
I need some time with my father. I wanna talk to you just for a moment as leaders, those of you who are leaders, and you're gonna make a difference. No is one of the most important things. You cannot be available to everyone all the time. If you're always available to everyone, eventually you will have nothing to give to anyone. We must be strategic about our no. We don't say no because we don't care. We say no because we really do care about what God has called us to do. Just because you could do something doesn't mean you should do something. Four different times. Four different times. The enemies ask for a meeting. Will you meet with us? 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 Four different times, Nehemiah gives them the same exact answer. No, I'm not gonna do it. Let's talk, stop building. No, 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 no. The fifth time, Scripture says this. The fifth time, Sambalat, this is the bad guy, his servant came with an open letter in his hand, and this is what it said. There's a rumor. That's how I always say it. There's a rumor. Side note, do you know what rumors do? Rumors are carried by haters, spread by fools, and believed by idiots. Did I just say that out loud? Maybe I did. There's a rumor. There's a rumor among the surrounding nations, and Geshem, he's not a bad guy, Geshem tells me it's true. The rumor is that you and the Jews are planning to rebel, and that's why you're building the wall. According to his reports, you plan to be their king. There's a rumor. Don't let the whispers of people distract you from the call of God. Don't let it happen. Don't let it pull you away. I hope you'll understand you will never do big things if you're distracted by small-minded people. We're never gonna let the opinions of others take us away from the calling of God. There's a rumor. In fact, one of my favorite, there's a rumor stories. I actually heard someone gossiping about me. Like, I know what happens, but I saw it and heard it. I was in the line at the grocery store with my little under nine items bag, and I was standing behind a cashier and another customer, and they were talking about the pastor of Life Church. And the customer leans into the cashier and says, I heard, there's a rumor, I heard that he flies everywhere in his helicopter. He flies from campus to campus in his helicopter. He has his own helicopter pad at his house. There's a rumor. And so they went through, and I came up there and gave them my nine items, and they kind of looked up at me like, whoo. And I just kind of smiled the whole time. And then at the end, I said, can you hurry up? My helicopter's waiting for me (laughs) outside (laughs) to take me to my next place. In fact, I had a mentor tell me this, and this will speak to some of you who are dealing with critics right now. But my mentor told me, don't worry about what people say about you. Worry about what's true about you. Just live a life that honors God and don't let the critics, don't let the haters knock you out of God's mission. There's a rumor, the guys say, Nehemiah, that you wanna be king. He replies in verse eight, there's no truth in any part of your story. You're making the whole thing up. Here's what happened. Instead of letting this opposition discourage Nehemiah, Oh, they don't like me, I can't please everybody, we're never gonna get this job done. Instead of letting it discourage him, God simply made him more determined. Our God is with us and we're going to do it. Watch how it's described in the very next verse, verse nine. They were just trying to intimidate us, imagining that they could discourage us and stop the work. So what did Nehemiah say? So I continued the work with even greater determination. I just continued on. No voice of people will talk me out of the calling of God. In fact, if you read in the text, what I love about it is the way they worked. If you read very carefully, they're up building this wall and they would work with a tool in one hand and a weapon in the other. I don't know about you, but I think that's cocky. That's kind of how I wanna preach. 
I've got the Bible in one hand and I've got a weapon, I've got the sword of the spirit and actually the same thing. And so that analogy just kind of broke down. But my Bible does it all, okay? You got a tool in one hand and you got a weapon in the other and we are prepared to do the work of God. And whatever opposition tries to talk us off, it doesn't discourage us, it builds our faith. Our God is with us and we do the work with even more determination. What do we know? Once the wall starts going up, once God starts to bless whatever you're doing, because what I know about you is you are created for more. That God gave you gifts to make a difference in the church and as the church out in the world. And the moment you take a step of faith, you may see some progress, You'll see some resistance. You'll see the hand of God build your faith. And one day, with the hand and the favor of God, you'll start making a difference in the life of switch students. You'll start making a difference discipling people through small groups. You'll start being a light and a witness to the people that you work with. You'll start being a voice of love and hope to those who aren't experiencing love and hope. And when that starts to happen and God starts to use you, You have to be careful that you don't let the external success do internal damage to your heart. What's really easy when we start seeing increase, when we start seeing success, is for us to start thinking it's because of us and that we're actually entitled to a little bit more. In fact, one of the biggest dangers of any kind of success, and Nehemiah would have to face this, is the temptation to start leading with an entitled spirit. And if I can tell you just honestly, this is something I have to watch for in my own life because a lot of people faithfully serve me and if I'm not careful, like I need it now and this, that, and the other, and I deserve more and I need some perks because of the sacrifices I've made and you have to watch for that when you're successful. I want you to see how Nehemiah dealt with the temptation to be distracted with an entitled spirit. Verse 10 says this. Nehemiah said, later I went to visit Shemaiah And he said to me, so here's a new character, and this guy's got some inside news for his buddy, Nehemiah. He said to me, hey, let us meet together inside the temple of God and bolt the doors shut. Why? Because Nehemiah, your enemies are coming to kill you tonight. So here's this guy who says, hey, Nehemiah, I'm your buddy. I've got some intel. Your enemies have a bounty on your head and they're coming for you. Let's you and me, go into the temple of God, we're gonna lock the doors and we're gonna be safe from your enemies. What's interesting is that Nehemiah actually had the authority to go into the temple. But if he did so for personal gain and not for the glory of God, he would have been abusing his power, he'd be sinning against God, and he would lose credibility with the people that he was leading. So what did Nehemiah do? Watch what he does in verse 11, scripture says this, but I replied, Nehemiah says, should someone in my position run from danger? Should someone in my position enter the temple to save his life? No, watch this, no, (laughs) I won't do it, he says. I realized that God had not spoken to this guy, but that he had uttered this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambalat, the bad guys, had hired him. This guy was actually a traitor. They were hoping to intimidate me and make me sin, then they would be able to discredit me. Here's what Nehemiah says, I'm not gonna hide out. I'm not taking any special privileges. I refuse to lead with an entitled heart. In other words, this wasn't about me when we started and it's not gonna be about me now. Feel it, Nehemiah, I didn't come to make a name for myself. I came to build a wall and that is what I will do. Nothing will distract me from that. Any diversion, any distraction, any temptation to do anything else, no, I won't do it. I say no to everything else because my purpose is to say yes to God's calling for my life. We have to watch for it. Whenever whatever you do starts to to succeed and to grow and to blossom, no, I will not lead with an entitled spirit. I'm here because of the faithfulness of my God. I served him in the beginning and I will serve him all the way through to the end. What happens? 
The enemies, they don't go away. I don't care how successful you are, they still show up. In fact, new levels often equals new devils, somebody said, okay? <laughs> so just get ready, they're still coming. Sambalat, Tobiah, and Geshem, they continued to taunt him. They tried to discourage him. They threatened his life and tried to distract him. And in verse three of Nehemiah six, I think this is probably my favorite verse in all of this book of the Bible. Finally, Nehemiah responds, and let me tell you what he didn't do. He didn't come down off the ladder. He stayed on the ladder, kept building the wall, and he sent them this message. I sent messengers to them saying, I'm doing a what? Let's say this loud, I'm doing a great work. Say it again, all of our churches, I'm doing a what? I'm doing a great work. If you remember in week number one, chapter two, we looked at this. Nehemiah said, let the good work begin. He knew when he started, it was a good thing. But as he continued to see the faithfulness of God, he realized this just isn't a good work, you see. This is a great work. This is something that my God created me to do. Put me in the exact place at the right time with the right king to grant me the right provision to do the right purpose, to go back and inspire the right people, to do something that will outlast me. This isn't just a good work. This is a great work. And Nehemiah sends the message to his haters, to the doubters, to the critics, and says, I'm doing a great work. I can't come down. I'm doing a great work. I can't be bothered by your opinion. I'm doing a great work. Your criticism will not deter me from doing what God created me to do. I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should I stop and leave and come down to you? I'm doing a great work. I'm not trying to do something that's impressive. My God has called me to do something important. I don't answer to you. I'm not trying to be popular. I'm just living out my purpose. I'm doing a great work. I can't come down. I don't know who this is gonna speak to today. I'm envisioning perhaps a mom with toddlers, drunk squirrels in diapers all over you all the time. And I hope you'll hear it You'll feel it because you want to do other things perhaps with your life right now. You're feeling a longing to do something different and I hope you'll realize that this season won't last forever. And what you're doing right now is a great work. Embrace the great work and don't come down. This season will pass and you can do more. You're doing a great work. Don't come down. I'm visualizing someone trying to pay off debt and it's slow dollar by slow dollar by slow dollar and the hill feels so big. Just tell the enemy, whenever you hear that, you'll never make it and it's not worth it. No, 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 no. What I'm doing is a great work and I can't come down. I'm doing what God has called me to do and I can't come down. Some of you, you're trying to love someone and switch that seems like you just can't reach them. Their heart seems so hard and you feel like giving up. No, 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 no. I will not give up. I will not back off. I will not stop. You see, I am doing a great work and I can't come down. You have a vision for something, a heart for something. You wanna make a difference and it seems like you take two steps forward and three steps back, but you don't give up the fight. You know that if you stay in the game and do not grow weary in doing good, that at the proper time, our God says, you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. No, 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 you don't understand. This is a calling. This is a burden and I cannot shake it. I am doing what God put on my heart to do. I'm doing a great work and I can't come down. Verse 14 and 15, crazy, miraculous story. 
But when you see the result, what I want you to see is there was not a supernatural miracle from heaven. It was a leadership miracle with the favor of God through the hands of ordinary people. And let me show you this miracle. Verse 14, Nehemiah says, remember, oh my God, he's praying again. He's talking to God. The same God that called him is the same God that equipped him, the same God that stood with him, the same God that empowered him, the same God that brought him favor and victory. Remember, oh my God, all the evil things that Tobiah and Sambala have done. And remember Noadiah the prophet and all the prophets like her who've tried to intimidate me. So on October the 2nd, the wall was finished. Just 52 days after we had begun the good work. 52 days. What I love about this is that there was no supernatural miracle from heaven. Notice this. There's no talking donkey. There's no fire from heaven. There's no burning bush. There's no bricks just started falling on each other. There's no parting of the Red Sea. There was no army of 10-foot angels, eyes blazing with fire, wielding heavenly chainsaws, singing, we are the champions. There's none of that in this whole story. There was just an ordinary guy whose heart was broken by the plight of his people. All the way back to week number one, he sat down to cry. He knelt down to pray, and he stood up to act. All through the story, he sought God faithfully. He made his plans carefully. He inspired people passionately. He pushed back the critics, and he kept his eyes on the prize. Whenever the enemies would try to distract them, he said no to anything that was lesser because he was saying yes to his greater work. In verse 16, this is what scripture says. When our enemies, when our enemies, all the people that tried to stop it, when our enemies and the surrounding nations heard about it, the wall has been built, they were frightened and humiliated. And they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. Who was it that was glorified? The one who called for it, the one who empowered it, the one who opened the doors, the one who made it possible, the one who was glorified through it. Our God was there in the beginning, our God was there in the middle, our God was there in the setbacks, and our God was there in the victory. And wherever you are in the process right now, our God is with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He is empowering you. He's stirring up within you. He is reinforcing his calling. No man can talk you out of it. When your enemies come against you, your God is still with you. Greater is the one who is in you than the one who is in this world. All things are possible. And when the enemy tries to talk you down, you just look down and say, no. No, no, and no, I am doing a great work and I will never ever come down. With all this said, four weeks of inspiration, four weeks of preparation, four weeks of motivation from our God. Somebody needs to hear this. You will never finish what you don't start. Sit down to cry, kneel down to pray, stand up to act.